Hi, Dr. Sunju. A warm welcome from Trivandrum. So, um, yeah, so, excuse me a second. We'll start of the session soon. Okay, so I was giving Dr. Sindhu a brief um, introduction about yourself. So I'll just, um, you know, because there are some new people have joined the stage, I'll just give a brief introduction about yourself. So basically, Dr. Sindhu Thomas is here to deliver a speech on AI-enabled clinical decision support system in musculoskeletal care. So AI-enabled, as I mentioned before, is a very hot topic in every industry right now, especially in warfare, health. So it is interesting to see and uh, hear your perspective on how artificial intelligence can uh, help in physiotherapy, especially in decision support in musculoskeletal care. So Dr. Sinji Thomas is a primary spine practitioner. He's a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist and certified McKinsey practitioner. Dr. Sinji, he is the first recipient of the Physical Therapist of the Year Award for the year 2021 by the American Physical Therapy Association, New York chapter. In the same year, he also secured a block in US patent for methods and systems for predicting a diagnosis of musculoskeletal pathologies, and two patents are also in pending stages in Europe and Australia. Being a technology enthusiastic clinician, he is harnessing his two decades of direct patient care experience in integrating the immense potentials of artificial intelligence into the field of physical therapy. So thank you, Dr. Sinju. I know it's, uh, you, know, uh, you came in a very you know, quick brief time. So thank you for accepting invitation also we have the chair people and i assume that you can see them as well isn't it dr sinju dr sinju yes yeah so we have on the dais two chairpersons so basically we have dr nandagoban r and dr arya Naveen. so i guess we can start off the session yes sure sure thank you thank so you. much for the yeah thank you so much thank you so much for that kind introduction I'm extremely sorry for not being able to be present there physically and I'm terribly missing the energy of being live there in, in my home state. Uh, we have a, a hot topic for today's discussion and I will try my best to do the justice to it. A disclaimer, I am the co-founder of Tarafa, a patented solution for uh, musculoskeletal triage and differential diagnosis. In today's session, we'll be covering uh, current problems in musculoskeletal care scientific opportunities ahead, a brief talk on AI in healthcare, significance of AI implementation in our profession, and then we will have our conclusion. Before we begin, did you know the musculoskeletal field is the single most expensive medical entity globally? The graph represents the top five US healthcare spending categories in 2016, and of course, the MSK leads. It is easy, easy to bring the US data as the healthcare services are delivered through either government run or private insurances. Here you see that the cost for MSK is far greater than combined cost for diabetes, urology, or other blood or endocrine uh, diseases. Even cardiovascular diseases are far lagging behind. It is alarming that in 2016, the U.S. spent over $134 billion for neck and back pathologies alone. And the total, co uh, total MSK care expenses were over $380 billion. Shockingly, less than 2% of these pathologies need in investigative procedures to identify any underlying red flags. Which means 90% or more of these cases are of pure mechanical origin that seldom needs a medical line of management and can be managed conservatively. So then what makes the field so expensive? Musculoskeletal care is notorious for lack of standardized care. Confusing clinical labels for the same pathology further complicates the situation. We heard on different classification systems like ICD, ICF and so forth. Additionally, there is poor awareness and implementation of evidence-based or guideline-based clinical practice. Finally, the field is very limited on objective measures, leading to over on imaging studies. One study in India indicates that over 90% patients with MSK complaints invariably receives prescription for imaging studies. All these result in low-value care and over-utilization of resources. So what are the prices we pay for these unnecessary imaging? 
there is absolutely no relationship between what is seen on a diagnostic image and the pain one is experiencing. Putting a point on an image is the beginning of a dangerous thought process. Even though the choosing wisely campaign are in effect, liberal imaging continues and is linked with greater work absenteeism, delayed care or recovery, opioid dependency and, and development of chronicity. Moreover, incidental findings leads to unnecessary healthcare utilization and resources. The disparity in MSK, musculoskeletal care, is a known fact. Increased variability in nomenclature across the medical profession creates disagreement interprofessionally and intraprofessionally. Though patients' complaints remain the same, the care they receive is highly varied. There is a 69% disagreement among spine surgeons on how they view recurrent lumbar disc herniation and 75% variation with the lower back treatments in general. These are the stakeholders involved and all of them have a long list of concerns. Patients are concerned of their inaccessibility to quality care and raising healthcare costs. They often feel they are not heard and are poorly informed on what's happening. Clinicians, on the other hand, are overwhelmed and suffer burnout. They have to compromise patient time for clerical words, uh, documentation and productivity demands. The new generation telehealth platforms are very limited with any kind of objective measures, and they have to rely on patients' version of story. They are hyper-vigilant on standalone alerts and are burdened with patients' expectation of instant relief. Insurance providers are frustrated with fragmented care and ineffective care pathways. The common thread that influences all stakeholders are patients' complaints and that is the scientific opportunity to capitalize. In a perfect world, medical diagnosis can be viewed as a complete information game in which clinical reasoning is nothing but data processing. It is an intriguing fact that 75 to 83 percentage of medical diagnosis can be obtained from merely talking to the patient. Yes, traditional history taking has tremendous value in diagnosis. Unfortunately, modern medicine has deliberately ignored its significance simply because medical history taking is time consuming, laborious and expensive. Though it sounds great, we have a problem. We only use five to nine facts in a single decision-making instance, leading to biased diagnosis and treatment. This is an interesting diagram. Um, it shows the number of variables involved in a clinical decision-making uh, process. With so many variables involved, history-taking is not an easy task. Timely diagnosis and treatment are often delayed and biased, which makes musculoskeletal care an ideal ground for AI in uh, AI implementation, which brings us to AI in healthcare. So what is AI in healthcare? AI in healthcare referred to the idea of machines being able to intelligently execute tasks in a manner similar to a clinician's thinking and behavior. An algorithm is any method for solving a problem or achieving a specific goal. I'm just going briefly through, um, very, very superficially through this uh, uh, topic, uh, this, this particular slide, because it's too, it's too vast and too deep. So there are three broad categories of AI. The first one is the rule-based expert system, which is the basic AI, then the machine learning models, and then deep learning models. Rule-based expert system utilizes decision trees that are designed to replicate the interpretation and decision-making of a subject matter expert. This has been used in devising uh, clinical decision support systems. So clinical decision support systems are electronic or non-electronic active knowledge system, specifically designed to aid clinical decision-making process. So how do they function? Patient's health information uh, is intelligently filtered to generate patient-specific evaluations or assessment and serves as recommendation to enhance patient care. Uh, uh, clinical decision support system functions in numerous ways of which some are to identify hidden patterns, perform detailed evaluations and recommend patient specific uh, treatment as I mentioned before. 
they optimize care delivered by implementing evidence into clinical practice. CDSS generates critical alerts and automates a ton of uh, repetitive or mundane functions. Traditionally, healthcare uh, delivery is solely depend uh, or based on medical knowledge or experience. Among, among numerous limitations of these systems, few of which require attention is disparity in quality of care delivered. Implementation of proven CDSs would help in providing standardized care. Let's get into the core of this presentation. As I mentioned before, 75 to 83 percentage of outpatient diagnosis can be extracted from an expert history taking, which is an intriguing scientific opportunity backed with technology and evidence. With AI and machine learning um, uh, uh, behind, a digital twin can be created from, a, from an unstructured patient story to be used as a diagnostic technology. We at Therapa rely on a rule-based expert system to accomplish the same. Everyone is comfortable with text messaging. Every patient invariably has to uh, fill out the patient intake form before their in-person or virtual consultation. We have created a platform to mimic a patient-clinician interaction, which effectively replaces the paper trail of intake form. A platform that does not um, restrict patient to express themselves that can be completed at the comfort of their home without the influence of a white cord syndrome. On the other hand, at the clinician side, a system that curates clinically relevant facts in a structured manner would be very efficient. If you take this to the next level, what about an embedded AI that can establish a hidden pattern between a patient's complaint and underlying systemic pathology that they may present? Technology can very well listen to patients' complaints and to do a comprehensive triage and even differential diagnosis. Even better, what if the entire chatbot interaction is automated as the subjective portion of clinical documentation? A speech-to-text feature at the clinician end for completing the rest of the documentation would be an additional perk. Therapist's algorithm is like a nutritional label. Clinician can better interpret the result based on logic and previous knowledge, which answers the much concerned explainability of the algorithm. More importantly, the solution integrates at the point of care and retains the clinician's decision-making privileges. Therapist's algorithm performs a thorough systemic evaluation when a somatic manifestation is identified and effectively triages musculoskeletal pathologies. For example, if the patient is coming with a gallbladder pathology, the initial complaints uh, would be like pain in the upper back or right shoulder. Therapha is designed to extract that hidden pattern between the um, uh, pancreatic or gallbladder complaint and the, pres uh, the somatic presentation the patient is uh, manifesting. So what is Therapha? Therapha is a patient-facing AI-enabled chatbot that effectively triages musculoskeletal pathologies, generates differential diagnosis, and automates clinical documentation, all without disrupting the clinical workflow. The traditional method is cumbersome and continues to use age-old technology, whereas the smarter way integrates to everyone's lifestyle. No more paper trail on information gathering. They are accomplished through the initial interaction with the chatbot. Verification of patient information is also accomplished over the platform versus going over the paperwork uh, or involving multiple people in the care pathway. Triaging is the most important of all. In, in the traditional care, it is happening in the, at the initial contact with the nurse and later with the a clinician. At Tarafa, the AI embedded within the chatbot intelligently filters uh, filter the variables that requires attention and even bundle them up into uh, to generate a uh, guideline based alert to implement at the point of care. The entire patient chatbot interaction, as I mentioned, would be automated as clinical documentation in a structured manner. Yes, you heard that right. No more uh, time or energy spent on writing uh, clinical notes. The inferences delivered at the point of care empowers clinician to make more informed decisions. The tool is not diagnosing per se, but Curating clinically relevant facts, bringing insight into patients' unstructured story, and serves as a cognitive aid. 
The automation enables clinicians to have more productive time with patients. The care would be patient-centered and enables shared decision-making. In the conventional care pathway, the patient is, um, patient is at the receiving end and holds no responsibility. Through more patient-centric care delivery, patients have a huge responsibility in their care, which brings more accountability. It simply means they need to be uh, they need to take an active role in the care they uh, they receive for it to, to be effective. Healthcare is very resistant to change, and it is a known fact that it takes 17 to 20 years of research to become part of um, um, 17 to 20 years of uh, of research to become part of clinical practice. It is only through judicious implementation of technology we can integrate research findings to clinical uh, routine clinical practice. Standardization of care uh, and implementation of evidence into practice, um, uh, there will be a significant cost saving. Which brings us to the conclusion. So why not we embrace a digital front door when it emphasizes patient centricity, when it integrates within the clinical workflow, when it empowers shared decision making, when it retains clinicians autonomy, when it boosts telehealth uh, services, when it improves efficacy and productivity to the entire healthcare ecosystem. What we need is vibrant leadership, willing to challenge the status quo and dare to take the inert risk that comes along. Thank you. I'm open to questions if uh, anybody has any questions. Hi, this is Nandan here. Uh, Hello. Hi, sir. It was a fantastic session. Actually, it uh, it's quite thought provoking as to what AI can do for us. So any takers on questions? Any points that need clarification? So, so Mr. Thomas, uh, could you tell us uh, when you are planning to launch in India? <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, here is a QR code that we have created. Um, kindly scan it, and uh, it's an early access. Um, it's a it's a small like you know um, uh, uh, autofill in kind of thing uh, that uh, you can enter your name um and email um so we are planning to launch uh, early december uh, we have completed uh, the um uh, the spine uh, portion of it we are working on the peripheral joint so that is the delay we want to when we launch we want to have a comprehensive msk so that's that is the delay so we are planning to launch by uh, early december okay now uh, getting down to brass tacks i do have a question though uh, uh, this actually makes a lot of things convenient for the clientele, uh, for our patients, your approach which is more of a person-centric than patient-centric, that is what I found useful. But um, I do have a query regarding the questioning pattern. Uh, see, uh, there seems to be a lot of, uh, just from the looks of it, a lot of leading questions. And uh, my understanding is uh, leading questions often lead to catastrophization of the condition itself. Uh, so how do you draw a line there? How do you, you know, create a finesse there with AI? Great question, uh, Dr. Nandaguma. Uh, so the, the reason behind the leading questions are um, the patient often no, don't know what are clinically re relevant facts. So if you ask them, uh, do you have so-and-so, do you have uh, so-and-so, they often realize that, uh, oh, Oh, I didn't know that that is clinically relevant or, uh, oh, I should mention that to the doctor. So oftentimes what we hear that this is the exact picture of what I'm going through. I am pretty sure I would not have mentioned this to the doctor or I thought uh, I never thought that is important uh, for the uh, for my diagnosis. So uh, we yes, we are do uh, we are giving leading questions, but we are not we are giving a ton of options. It's not like a how terrible your back pain is. We, we are not asking uh, like that, you know. So if you are asking like, a, oh, how terrible your back pain is, then they often go with the, the word terrible, right? So we give an option. Do you have any back pain? Do you have any pain? What kind of pain? And we give a ton of options. If you look at uh, the options uh, 
uh, for pain we have like almost like 18 different version uh, of uh, pain description so we are collecting the subjective portion of the um, uh, of the uh, clinical picture and uh, we are uh, extracting an algorithm from the patient story and presenting to the clinician at the point of care so we are leaving that to the clinician to make the uh, the judicious uh, and wise decision on, uh, on what are the clinically relevant facts Oh, that's good. That's good. And uh, how are you taking into account the biopsychosocial aspects of the patient, the emotional quotient? Absolutely. I can see that, uh, Dr. Nandagubar, you are in uh, MSK field. I can very well say it's all key questions. Yes, absolutely. As we very well know, uh, musculoskeletal pathologies, um, uh, you know, the newer model of care is the biopsychosocial um, model, right? Where uh, uh, the patients start with a uh, a bio uh, anatomical pathology or anatomical uh, an environment which turns out to be a, a uh, uh, the, uh, the chronicity develops uh, because uh, the timely uh, diagnosis and treatment uh, often time often uh, delayed so we have six inbuilt um, um, psychological assessment like uh, from uh, early signs of uh, depression to um, um, signs for suicidal signs of uh, suicidal thoughts we have like six levels of uh, identification that's fantastic so you have covered all your bases quite well i guess <laughs> yes we are trying we are trying we uh, completed two irb approved studies and a third study just we got approved in uh, garden city college uh, we got an approval for uh, the third study um, so yeah we are we are covering all, all, all from all ends fantastic fantastic i think uh, we'll conclude our session now now that the yes. question part is over yes so, absolutely thank you, thank you so, so much, much for an illuminative session with us i'm going to okay. hand it over to our mc yes thank you so much and please um, um, scan the qr code and uh, enter your information so that you'll be the first one uh, getting access in india and uh, we may give um, a 30 day uh, free trial Thank you, Dr. Sinji, sir. It's, um, it's a great honor and privilege to have you here. It's a bit unfortunate that, you know, we couldn't uh, all meet you in person. And we also <laughs> wanted to give you a memento, but, um, you know, since it was a virtual space that we all enter in, your memento will be on its way and will be given by Dr. Sridhar, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sinji. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Cheers, mate. Um, next, uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Ashwini Raj to, to felicitate and give a memento to Dr. Nanda Gobind, sir. Now, can I request Dr. Umesh KK to give a memento to Dr. Arya, please? Yes, thank you, sir. Yes. 